Hi, and welcome to the Jess and Scott and You Show. We are here tonight, and I have to tell you, today has been an amazing day. And when we were planning this show, Scott and I, we were like, what are we going to do, and how are we going to learn about ghostwriting, and who do we know? And so we went out, and we did some research, and we, we had a plan, and that plan fell through at uh, 4.15 a.m. Pacific time this morning. And so what what Scott and I did spent this morning doing was reaching out and going, okay, well, now what is this going to look like? And it turns out today is meant to be the day for ghostwriting, this ghostwriting topic, and it turns out that this is the day that we were supposed to have Chris and Nora join us, and we will be introducing them in just a minute. So thank you all for being here tonight. I am blessed about the ability that I have to adapt today, and I am so grateful for that. <laughs> and, we, and we'll find out about what Scott's grateful for in just a minute. All right, see you after the intro. Okay. Well, I'll be grateful if this works. Um, well, let's find out. Here we go. And... Before we get started, check this out. So, Kitty says, I'm finally going to watch you live. Yay! We're <laughs> going to you you know, so talk about a great writer. Yeah. What yes. she, what she, she works, does the heavy lifting. She just doesn't cut and paste. She really internalizes things and then rewrites them in terms of her reviews or her previews of Hangouts on Air. And so, we love that she's here so much. Look at this. We're going to shout out another one here. Yay, Nora, hugs to you from Kitty. All right. And then Johnny says, hi, Jess, Scott, and you and everybody. So we are so welcome to have you tonight. Scott, what are you grateful for now that that actually worked? Well, you know, there are just so many great oh, – I wasn't expecting that, <laughs> Jess, because I am, I am so grateful for so many things, you know, and the thing – I'm, well, I'm grateful for you, you know, so there. <laughs> and that's, but also, you know, Nora and Chris and John uh, may be joining us uh, in progress a little yes. bit later. That's um, uh, and what a great topic. The more research into this topic, the more questions arose in my mind. And it was, I thought, you know, I, well, I never thought about ghostwriting. Um, and um, so it's going to be really interesting to find out, you know, the inside story. Especially now, because writing is becoming the new currency. It's coming back in vogue. Did it ever go out of vogue? I just thought yeah. I wasn't really good at it. Yeah, okay. I think. <laughs> no, no, it, it honestly did. I mean, okay. pe people, um, there is there is a time there, and it, well, it's a, it's a, it's the whole content marketing uh, phenomena that's that's coming back. And if you want to make an impression, especially with Google Plus, you've got to communicate, and you can do it you know, with graphics and you can do it with video and whatnot, but the primary engine is is writing. And it used to be that there were just very few people who would be expected to write and you'd be in the New Yorker, or you'd be in the local newspaper, or there'd be, you know, something like that. So writing was always there, it's just that it wasn't democratized. Now uh, it's available for everybody to be able to step up onto the stage and to be, present themselves and say, here I am and I've got something interesting to say, but what if you don't want to say it in writing? Can Which you hire someone else to do it? Which is why we have Chris here, who's a freelance writer in Florida, specializing in content creation and content strategy for startups and small business and businesses on the web. And we have Nora, who is a coach, and she says, let's see, she specializes in coaching creative and ambitious female business owners worldwide to create and grow beautiful, profitable, and sustainable businesses while enthusiastically enjoying life. I like the words enthusiastic enjoy, and I also like strategy for startups. So, <laughs> you can Nora, see why we're friends. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. 
Yes, exactly. Nora, will you, what else would you add to that introduction about yourself? Yeah, I think one fun thing is I also co-host the Career Coach thing. So we have speakers on all the time that talk about various things that to enhance someone's career, which is why I feel like I can talk about this. So we've had authors on how to write a book in a weekend, ghostwriting, working with a VA. So all of those topics of how to make someone's business better, and one of which has been, do you hire a ghostwriter? Do you write yourself? Do you do vlogging? Do you do blogging? Like, what works for you? So I'm really looking forward to the conversation tonight. Yay. And Chris, what else would you add about yourself for Introdu introducing yourself? Uh, you know, not much. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Um, I love the topic, and, uh, you know, we talk about this a lot. We do a, me and Nathaniel Brennis, you probably know, we do a, a, every Thursday we do a weekly hangout where we talk about a lot of stuff, but almost always it comes back to content, so um, I'm just happy to be here talking about my favorite thing with all you lovely people. Yeah, right on. Well, so I I want to start out in the stratosphere, and there's nobody better to take us there than Scott. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, okay. I mean, uh, for 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 those who are new to the to the series, I really worried about it for a long time because I thought that I had to stick to the topic and I had to be I had to behave and at some point I decided you know what I can do is I can become as philosophical as I want to be and and go off on tangents and whatnot this this the series is you know just plus Scott plus you shows for entrepreneurs and small business people and and so then Jess can always you know it's her job to reel me back in so she gives me a little bit of a license at the beginning of the program and and that gets the juices running and then we get to go from there and that's my story. Now, Jess. <laughs> and I'm not letting you stick to it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so the more I thought about ghostwriting, the more I was thinking, uh, isn't this cheating? Okay. So this is this is my stratosphere. You, you go off and you tell someone, here's an idea. Why don't you go ahead and uh, now this is this is a lay person's uh, uh, idea of what ghostwriting is who hasn't really thought about it deeply. So you can you can fi fix it later on in the show but someone says go off and and do some writing for me and here's the general topic and then come back and I'll put my name on it and I'll get all of the credit I'll get all of the money and um, you know you can you can go from there and the more I thought about it I thought how how is that possible I mean how much of a how much of a contribution to the final product is it incumbent upon the client uh, to or the person under whose signature that writing that piece of work appears. How much of it has to be that person, and how much of it as a ghostwriter is yours? Uh, and then I've just got a ton of more questions beyond that. But may maybe that would be a good way to start rolling, uh, rolling the uh, uh, the conversation. Jess, did you want to add anything to that? Um, uh, no. I think we're. I think that's a great starting point. <laughs> I don't want to lose. Right. The, I don't want to lose the the the, the threat which we were talking about. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, what is the relationship between the client and uh, the ghostwriter in terms of the balance of power and how much of any of any work of art you know is? Go I'm ahead. wondering what if do we need to take a step back and define what ghostwriting is before we answer this question, just so yeah. we're all working from the same. So from the same starting point? Yeah. That, okay. That's a great, great, uh, nice point. So what, uh, so how far off the, how far off the mark have I, have I thrown us and how, how can, how We're can you bring back us back to, on? No problem. We, uh, we have a great comment from Lori waiting to just be shared. So, um, let's start with what is ghostwriting? So, um, Scott is learning about ghostwriting. I've had ghostwriting services and used them before in my business, but I want to hear from you, Nora and Chris. What is ghostwriting to you? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, to me, ghostwriting is just, you know, you're you're helping a business or you know an entrepreneur, anybody, uh, put content on their website. Or a lot of times, ghostwriting ghostwriting is looked at uh, more for book book authors, but you know, it's really anywhere, and it's just 
just when somebody can't uh, articulate what they want in words, they have to hire someone else to help them. That's what I consider ghostwriting. That sounds. That's. I, I've got follow-up questions, but uh, Nora, what 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 are your thoughts? You know, I. Okay, this is gonna show not a very positive side of myself, but I learned about ghostwriting through Bravo TV. So I can't think of who the PR person is, but she had a publicist that got a ghostwriter to write her first book. Awesome girl. Can't escaping me. And then Beth, Bethany Frankel had someone help her with her book. So I think that there is a huge distinction between what an editor is, whether you're writing something, whether someone else is taking your ideas and your stories and putting them into a, a tangible work of art, whether it's a blog post or a book or what have you. And so to what degree, how much is you and your voice and your stories versus you know, essentially paying for someone else's articles that they wrote for your blog or your newsletter. So there, there is a huge degree of variation on how someone could use a ghostwriter and what benefit it, it, it deems the individual that's choosing to hire them and how you feel in integrity using one. So this is a really fun topic. So I think we're going to come back to these. I think we're going to come back to these distinctions between. It sounds like we might need more than one show on ghostwriting. Is what it sounds like to me. So we're going to try and cover a lot of stuff here. So to go back to Scott's topic, is it cheating? First, we're going to bring up Lori. She says, "Is it cheating to go to the hairdresser, Scott?" <laughs> <laughs> and then, yes, yes, it is. And then, <laughs> Kitty, was it, Kitty liked that very much. That's so funny. <laughs> So, what okay. do you guys think, Chris and Nora? Well, uh, you know, is it cheating? I don't, I, you know, I don't think so. I think that there's a lot of people out there that, you know, they have to run a business, and I mean, even if they could write, or even if they wanted to, um, I mean, they just don't have the time most of the time, you know. And some of them are perfectly skilled at what they do, but they can't write, and that's okay. So. You know, hiring a good writer is where, you know, it, it, you don't just say, hey, here's a here's a topic and write about this. A good writer will, will kind of irritate you because they'll ask you so many questions. They want to stick to you and see, you know, hear your voice and hear what you think about the topic. And, I mean, this could go on and on, but you don't just hand them a topic and say, here you go. Um, so, no, it's not cheating. They have to have a writer that can can take their experience and put it down on paper or on the web and, and, and uh, you know, our reference so, book. So, so what, uh, Chris, what a, a good way to characterize it is that if, if I've got the raw materials, if I've got the ingredients, I can give them to you and then you get to cook it up and you can cook a great meal. I, I'm terrible in the kitchen, but at least <laughs> I've got the raw ingredients. Would that be a way of thinking about the, the relationship between the the client and the ghostwriter. Um, I think that's a that's a pretty good you know analogy. I think it's pretty good. Okay. Well, I think that there is a difference between paid for like pre-written articles that you can choose to select and then use in your newsletter or on your blog, versus actually collaborating with an author or with a writer oh, yeah. who is taking your ideas and creating something that is your own to be used. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, so, uh, Nora, I mean, you were saying taking a pre-written. I mean, is it that is it that I can pre-write an article and then sell it to you, and then you can put it on your blog and under your name? Is, is, uh, maybe my naivety and uh, idealism is coming through, or something like that. Is is that done? That that is done. Yeah. Wow. Even 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 though you you I won't say you because I don't want to impugn your. Yeah, I don't do it, but it, no. it can be done. But. So someone someone can do it, and their fingerprints do not appear at all on that, except after they've they've purchased. That that really surprises me. So there's a lot of, and that's interesting because I would say a variation of that, which is what ended up um, happening in a situation where I've used a ghostwriter before, is that it turned out that 
what I thought was collaboration actually and all of the questions actually didn't reflect my voice and so I used what came back to me as research material and then I used that as the basis and rewrote it in my voice to actually get the point and the focus that I wanted. It was not my intent but that was how it played out. Mm -hmm. No, this, this is a good point, maybe. Uh, I was going to ask the question, and this feels like a good time to do it. So I'm, I'm thinking I don't have time or I don't have talent, and I want to hire a, a, a ghostwriter. What's a good way to find a ghostwriter, and what's a good way to vet one? Because if you're a ghostwriter and you've written things, aren't you supposed to, can you keep it secret? I mean, can you, can you say, well, actually, John over there, you know, Peter over there, says that he wrote that and the world thinks he wrote it but actually I wrote it and I'm going to share it with you well aren't you can you actually get away with that or how can I vet you in terms of being a, a ghostwriter both in terms of your portfolio and you know what question should I ask of you how can I make sure that you're good for me Chris I'll defer Chris? to you no? Chris you go first oh you know this is an area that's you know I really don't know a whole lot about it, you know, as far as the legal terms and stuff like that. But I mean, when you ghostwrite something for somebody, um, <clears throat> or when I do, depending on what it is, like if it's a niche I'm trying to get into, I'll, you know, you ask them up front usually, can I use this in my portfolio? Do you mind letting me say, you know, of course my name's not going to be on the, on the content, but um, can I use this? And a lot of times. Uh, especially bigger businesses will tell you. I think I think this falls under the non-disclosure uh, agreement. I'm not sure, but um, they'll let you know right up front. You can't, you know, you can't say that you can't use this in your portfolio. You can't use this in any way. Once you hand it to us, uh, you're done with it. <laughs> and so it's like you, a work for hire in a website, uh -huh. right? So it's it's so it is it is something that when you do it. The it is not part. It's not part of your portfolio. It's part of the client's portfolio. Is what, right. is that what yeah, you're describing? Exactly. Okay. A lot of times, it's you know you don't get to cl have any claim to it after it's done. I, mean, I don't so, like. Them. So is there kind of a subculture that goes around that you know uh, people will say, well, you know, uh, Chris, Chris and Nora really can't can't say uh, uh, show them, but you know the reputation is, I mean, if you really want, I mean, is, is there that type of um, under-the-radar uh, communications that, that can go on nowadays? Well, I mean, there's also the testimonial section. So if you give your references, speak to someone that has, does consider themselves a professional ghostwriter, who have they worked with, and is that person willing to speak with you? Okay. Is a great way to go. So th I think that is one of those industries, for me at least, I found to be very referral driven. Boy, just learning so much Check about this it. Out. So Lori says, my writing community has Roz Morris in the spotlight for the month of March. She is a best selling ghostwriter. There you so, go. Yeah. So Basically. there is some sort of yeah, culture out there where you can find the right people. I think you just have to know what to look for. And I have to tell you, I don't know what to look for. And so when I'm thinking about you know, this big picture of what a ghostwriter is and what a ghostwriter isn't. When, you know, do, is this a time where I can't just go, oh yeah, they have references. I actually need to call those references. Do we? How much due diligence do we actually need to consider when we're thinking about doing something with ghostwriting? Well, I, I found that you could also, like, test people. So mm -hmm. they, like, if you have an ongoing blog or you have something that you've written, then you could say, here's the work that I've done so far. I'm looking to hire a ghostwriter for this intent, like blog posts or I'm working on a book right now. And it's, you read this and we'll meet. And then from that point, you tell me what you think you hear or what you see in my voice or what I'm trying to say or convey or who you think my target market is. So that way you can see if it's a good fit and whether they've done their homework and can match your voice. So, so in this case, you see, you see the clouds, as it were, to see if if rain will, would could be produced by, by you know sharing the, this 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 is who I am and this is how I present myself to the world, and you use that as a launching a launching point. Absolutely. So, we're in you know from your experience now. The other thing is, I know um, 
do ghostwriters like to be ghostwriters, or do they like to be? Cr you know, I mean, if I'm a if I'm a writer, what makes me prone to doing more ghostwriting work versus want me wanting to be a contributor at least, or like a secondary author to what is being written? Um. <clears throat> well, you know, I think um, what would make somebody want to be a ghostwriter is. You know, in a lot of cases, there's a little bit more money involved because all writers want their their name on their content. You know, it's it's just <clears throat> you know when you give it away, it, it really is like giving your children away. It really it really hurts, you know, because you spent so much time crafting this beautiful piece of art, and now you've got to let it go. So, I think what makes a lot of ghostwriters ghostwriters is that there's a little bit more money involved, at least on the web, and um. Beyond that, um, I, I don't really know. I think that I'm, I'm not sure. I, th I guess there's probably a group of people that really do enjoy it, and sometimes it is fun f speaking from my point of view. Um, but I think it really depends on the project. Well, okay, I'm I'm going to just jump in here because one of my question is is how much do you charge then? How you know? Uh, well, two. What? I'm not going to hear. Let's. <laughs> no, I, 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 I can say whatever I want to, and then you can bring us back. Yeah. No, and and I, I was unskillful. It's not what you charge, but let's say, <laughs> let's say that there is, let's say there is a blog post or something that is out there. Um, how much can a person um, reasonably expect? And and you want to get this word out because everyone thinks that you know it's going to be less expensive than it really is. Is it? So let's clarify a little bit with that because Gail Harris made a comment earlier about looking for a ghostwriter. I would assume pricing would also follow this model. Well, you know what they say about assume, but whatever. I'm going to do that right now. So, <laughs> so what, do we, what do you mean by that, Jess? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Um, so is it for a book? Is it for a website? They each, ha you know, they're each going to have their own purpose. So modifying her comment just a smidgen for what you're talking about now. Well, okay. So if if there's let, let's just say a nice you know juicy uh, um, um, blog post or something like that. Is it like, well, I mean, is it like seven you know seven cents a word? Is it seven fifty a page? Uh, what I, I have an idea. What is the currency of um, of um, charging? How do you come up with something that is measurable that you can say, if I do this, then it'll cost that. So what is the this and how much would a range be for the that? You, I think, okay, I, I don't know. Do you guys want to answer that or do you want me well, to take this one? <laughs> Gail, Gail had a comment too saying uh -huh. in publishing, ghostwriters make more money than if their name was on the cover. That's right. So if that gives you any kind of indication. And here's another one, and this is where I was going to go with it. Katrina says, I do ghostwriting. It depends on the content I'm creating. Um, blog posts, I don't mind if I don't get credit. I recently ghost wrote an ebook, but I got my name as an editor. So I think that's, you know, I think there that's really interesting. And I can tell you that um, my editor, copywriter, um, she, uh, we actually do everything by the project. So even though we've been working together for years now, we still have a project base because some of my stuff needs more editing than other parts of my stuff, and um, and I and I think that also plays a role into if I'm creating something and I just want it polished, there's going to be a difference in value there or about value of actually having the work done. Yeah, um, you know, if I can, I'll, I'll just jump in a little bit on what on what Scott was saying, and you know, it's. That's a question I'm sure we all get asked a lot. Um, any freelancer, any anybody that does business is, you know, how much is it? But uh, it's just it's so different. And what I tell people a lot of times when you're when you're hiring a writer, um, especially a ghostwriter, you're not, you know, it's not really about paying for the word. It's not per word. What you're buying is research. So you can go to Fiverr and buy a 500 word article for five bucks, but when you're hiring a writer, you're, hi you're hiring their experience and you're hiring how good they can research and how long they're going to research and how well they can craft it. So, um, you know, it's, it's just so, so very, you can never really um, put a set price on anything like that. 
Mwah! I would give you applause. My bandwidth doesn't support that. <laughs> and with anything, like any time you hire someone else, you are paying for their expertise, you're paying for their knowledge, you're paying for their mind thinking about your project and actually doing the, the hardcore work of it. Yeah. So it's not just how many words work out or how many hours they spend on something. Like, if they care and they're truly dedicated people that are interested in what you are doing, they're thinking about your project in the shower. Yeah. <laughs> I, right. you pay for that, it's worth everything. Absolutely. No, yeah. so let's talk about, you know, leveraging. So maybe I like to write, but I have other priorities that I know I can't outsource. So when I'm in my small business or medium sized business or role that I play within a large company, the I feel that there is a lot of um, bandwidth, you know, leveraging time by finding a, a ghostwriter or a copywriter or a writer to come in and provide some, you know, some assistance with the content creation that I'm looking to create for whatever my strategy is in whichever role I'm in. Do you guys counsel your, um, have you counseled people, your clients of, about that? What, do you, what to think about in terms of leveraging time and resources? Because, I mean, I'll use accounting as a, in my example. It takes me eight hours, something it takes my accountant to do in two hours. And so by far, done, much better cost of you know, use of my time for what's actually going to be work product versus admin. And, you know, when I think about it in writing, if I'm a, whether I'm a good writer or not, if I have a really good relationship and I'm writing some and I'm having somebody help write in some capacity, what, you know, what are some criteria that we could use and think about to know is it the right way to leverage what we have in our business? So, uh, you look like you want to. I don't. Am I cutting you off, Nora? You look like you're. Yep, fixing. go for it. Okay. Um. So, if I if I'm understanding you right, you're kind of asking, you know, um, when? It, how do you know when you need a ghostwriter or or any writer to help, right? Um. You know, I think <laughs> that's a pretty difficult one. Um. I, th I think you can look at your workload and really tell. You can look at, you know, you try to talk with them about their workload. What are they trying to do? What are their end goals? Um, how many hours are they putting in right now every day? And then you can kind of tell from there. Um, I guess that would probably be about all I could really say on that, just, you know, workload and hours in the day and how much do you have left and uh, go from there. Nora? Do you have yeah, a... I mean, yeah, so fair, totally agree. I mean, it's all about leveraging your resources and what you're good at. Um, I have a lot of these conversations with my clients or upcoming coaches that coach you, and it goes back to who they are and what their strengths are. So we're specifically talking about a blog, like having a blog of some sort. If they are not writers, totally cool. Like, is blogging an option? Is, you know, doing a video, is there some other, or an audio of some sort, a podcast version, is there something else that better suits who they are? Sometimes that's the case, sometimes it's not. But if it escalates and it gets to the point where, like, you want to write a book, you want to have that platform, you know, is that there that option where, yes, they speak better than they write? So could they dictate it and then have an editor? Or is ghostwriting truly, like, is the collaboration process really important to them? Because it, regardless, it takes time. You have to sit down with that person and share your stories and share what you want to say and what your voice is and what your message is and who your target audience is. So regardless, it does take time. So it, it comes down to the individual and what works best for them. I love the idea of ghostwriters. I've never used one. Um, Originally, when I first heard about them, and some of my favorite authors, I found out were had their books had been ghost written. That's a word. I, I was less than pleased. I, I, I didn't really? feel like it was an integrity. I've, you know, since learned the importance and how it works and the skill of the people behind the scenes. Um, so I, I see all sides of it, but it's really like 
what you need, what your audience is, how you can be of service, and what feels right in showing up in the world. Isn't this just a great topic? I mean, this is so it is. juicy. It's really cool because, and you know, what Chris and Nora just said, it made me think, okay, so not only if I'm going to leverage it, maybe I need to think about how many hours, but another thing would be, and Nora, you just said this that made me go, oh, is is writing, the written word, ebooks, blog posts, actual books, is that what the audience wants? And if that's not your strength, is a ghostwriter actually what could help somebody if you really wanted to do it yourself? Or in that case, are you looking for an editor? Right. And there is a huge, huge distinction between the two. Yes. Please tell me because <laughs> I, the, best the, question, the best questions are the short ones. Please tell me. Or, you know, it's a plea, not a question. It's a, it's a plea. Please. Difference between copywriting and editor and ghostwriting. Oh, okay. Well, Chris, you can totally correct me because you are a writer and this is what you do. But so from my perspective, so if you are to write something, and you could be like me, you cannot spell with a heck. Um, or you have, re you have really good ideas. But there, you do need that common thread that ties everything together, and that's kind of what I see the benefit of having an editor is. They're the people to go in, clean up, question what you're doing, kind of like that high school English teacher saying, you know, your college essay could be better. Let's make it more succinct. And then, so then you escalate to the next level where you have a ghostwriter. So you're literally sharing your ideas, stories, where you want to go, what you hope to convey to the audience, that kind of thing. So they are technically writing it, even though it's based off of your life or your ideas or your suggestions. And then the copywriter, generally speaking, is usually to monetize something. So it's what are the keywords, what are the emotions you can hit on, what's the buy, you know, how to get someone to buy with your copy. It's how I look at it, but I could totally be wrong. So Chris, I'll defer to you. That's what your copywriter does? Mm -hmm. Yes, my editor and copywriter happen to, I am very lucky to have, the, they are Pam, they're the same person, and that is exactly what she does, and right now the focus is on getting people to click through to read something on the website, or to come over to Google Plus, or to find us on Twitter, or to go over to something that was posted on Facebook or LinkedIn, and um, it's way better than, I mean, you know, the seven titles for lazy bloggers that Chris just wrote was really awesome, and I'm awesome. like, oh. Right? Now maybe I'm like, okay, I could probably do that, but I'm used to her doing it and I don't even have to think about it anymore. But if you don't have an editor or a copywriter and you want to do that, you've got to read Chris's latest <laughs> Well, and then, you know. I, I always kind of do plan B. Like, I love this person. This is the person I work with. But what happens if I get hit by a bus tomorrow? Can I yeah. find someone else that can write with the same tonality that I use that can yeah, so it, there is that smooth transition between, well, I guess in this case, dead person to live person, but whatever whatever the transition is. Well, yeah, exactly. Unexpected leave of any kind. Yes, yes. Thank like you. Like hit by a bus. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's always, that is all, you know, people ask me all the time, what do I do if you're hit by a bus, Jess? And I'm like, well, that's a really, we got everything written down. You're just going to have to watch a little closer. And I think that's probably what would happen because a new relationship has to be built. So even though somebody might be able to get that tonality right, if your current editor, copywriter, ghostwriter takes a break of some kind, <laughs> there's still going to be a relationship. Uh, there's still a new relationship and a lot of trust that has to be built. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, um, I didn't think I micromanaged until I did this. Uh, and I was like, wow, I really have control issues. And yeah. that's... <laughs> oh, you know, this is this not on my notes, but here's a great question. What makes, what makes a, you know, we're talking about ghostwriters. What makes a good uh, client? Wait, if you're a ghostwriter? If you're a ghostwriter, what may, how, how can I be a good client to you if you're my ghost? If, if I hire you as a ghostwriter, what, is, what should I do? Okay, Lori, Gail, Kitty, Katrina, you guys all write too. We want your answers in the comments. 
And anybody else who writes that we missed, because I see those are the guys that I'm seeing, um, excuse me, ladies, those are the ladies that I am seeing um, talk about writing and different parts of ghost writing and editing. So we want your, we want your answers too. Okay. Uh, it, I'll be quick because I can tell that Nora, uh, she's got something to say there. So. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, no, I've seen you perk up when you asked. So I'll be my perfect client is, uh, you know, somebody who's not really necessarily looking for, you know, the cheapest uh, job because, you know, that makes it really rough. But um, that's not everything. Really, the best client I can have is somebody that lets me, you know, talk to them and they're willing to communicate because, like I was saying early on, that um, you really got to get it get a feel for how they talk and what, you know, that just them in, in, in general. So it's good to have a client that you can just call them and talk to or even, you know, they call you. And I know that that can kind of get out of hand sometimes, but um, the opposite end of that is really rough to write for. Somebody that doesn't want to get on the phone and, you know, they want to email you one time and then they want, you know, magic. So... Uh, definitely being able to spend time with them. That's that would be my best client. Okay, Nora. I, yeah, I would say the same thing. I think it's with anything, trust, collaboration, willingness to share, just be open. It, it's wow. hard. It's hard to work with anyone new. It's hard to delegate anything. But from a writer's perspective, you need that person to open up, trust, be straightforward with what they what their expectations really are. Writing is such a personal thing, and what I think I hear you both saying is the the best client is one who is vulnerable and who kind of lays lays open, you know, who they are and what what they want. Yeah, and, and as a go ahead. Oh, that's fine. I well, I'm I'm going to add vulnerable to the authenticity list here soon yeah. because not not beca you know because I'm hearing it everywhere. But you're right to be able to let your guard down a little bit and allow somebody to know you more than what you might. Um, oh good, we have our first one coming in, so let me see. So while, while you do that, it's... Um, I'm going to bring this up because, well, but I have a se segue question to this. So here's what Kitty said. Kitty says, I'm just reading a book called On Becoming a Writer, which Denise Hughes, the author, lists four reasons for reader-based prose like blogs, which apply, which she thinks applies to this discussion. Encourage, entertain, inform, and persuade. So copywriting falls under the persuade category. It's usually used in the context of advertising and actually needs extra skills. A to C can be managed by a ghostwriter, methinks. Yeah. I think that's great, actually. Okay, on. What, the whole title. On becoming a writer. And then, let's see, Gail Harris says, a copywriter writes ad sales promo literature. An editor works with the content given by the author and can do much writing. A ghostwriter actually writes. This is a very basic, the ba these are the basics, but the main difference is. And here was Katrina's. She says, someone who is open to questions is honest about what, uh, honest about the information that they actually have versus the information they need me to do and they're clear and and what their clear end goal is. The icing on the top is trusting me to help them create what they need. And did you see Lori's, Jess? Oh, here we go. This one, I would charge less for a contract in a long-term relationship, a retainer for X amount of work each month, someone who trusts my judgment. Thank you, that one. Just, I'm glad we didn't miss that one. Yeah. yeah. Which segues out into this thing because, you know, we've got all these um, boutique and not boutique social media agencies. And in the end, what are they doing? They're doing some ghost writing in terms of the, co the, the length of things that they're posting. They're doing some copywriting because they're trying to get you to click on things or like things or engage in some way. So, um, well, now, Scott's usually the one that does this, but... Do we need to be asking different questions of our social media agencies if we are choosing to use them? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, social media agencies, I don't know. That's a tricky job. They're all, all in itself. So, um, I mean, that's a 
social media, like like you probably read in the, in my in my last post, there, that is is a proving ground for all of your content. Um, I mean, even you know Facebook. I think Twitter is probably the the cruelest, but um, if your stuff's just not good, then it's going to get chewed up and spit out there. So I think you'll know if you got a good social media agency pretty quickly, I think. Uh, but maybe I'm not the one to ask about that. Okay, Nora, your turn. Um, if, if you yeah, have an opinion. I, no, I mean, I have a friend that's a publicist. I know what she pushes out, but I, I, I can't speak firsthand. I have never used a social media agency to to do anything that I was working on. So I don't feel like I could speak freely about that. I'm, I'm, I'm also wondering, I mean, we're, we've got a topic, so we're talking about ghostwriting, but aren't, uh, aren't, don't people's needs kind of go along a spectrum and, and they dip into ghostwriting, they dip into copywriting, they dip into editing and so forth, and those are kind of blended. So at the end of the day, you might wear different hats depending on the needs of a particular project, and and you might even do a little bit of this and a little bit of that for the same client. Does it does it work that way? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's why uh, earlier when you were asking, you know, how do you find a ghostwriter? Um, I think you know the best way is to just find you know a writer because. They're, you know, they're going to say what, uh, some of them may not do ghostwriting, but I think the majority of them do, so um, it's just like you said, writers especially wear, wear all kinds of hats, you know. Um, mm -hmm. On my on one of my sites, I t you know, tell them right there, I do, you know, I don't do much editing um, because I hate chopping it up, I hate that part, <laughs> uh, but you know, I do copywriting, ghostwriting, um, you know, social content, stuff like that, so yeah, you're right, we do wear, wear a lot of hats. And, you know, uh, we'll be going on to some other segments or some other things soon, but this, this question pops into my head, uh, Chris and Nora, and that is, um, and it just popped out of my head, and had I not said that, it would not it would have stayed in there. Let me think if I can remember it. Well, when I remember it, I'll, I'll ask the question. Jess, I need, to, I need your help. All right. Pink, well, your turn. got it. So, it, you know, I, I really want... To, I, I am interested for anybody who works with or uses a social media agency to weigh in on that and did their ability to copyright or edit or ghostwrite some of your content come on your radar or did it not at all because I'm thinking now I don't use a social media agency but I have considered it a time or two and it, something hadn't felt right to me and I think this might be the missing element is I didn't know what other questions to ask to ensure that my voice would be I say my voice my voice the voice of my company what my brand stands for would be able to be truly conveyed and so um, I'm thinking about that in a little bit of a different in, in a little bit of a different light did that help you remember at all Oh, if you're talking to me, yeah, yeah. My my question is, can you be on staff with someone? You're working for, a, you know, a, a company, an agency, or something like that. Can you be on staff and a ghostwriter? Or by definition, does that disqualify you from being a ghostwriter because you're actually working on payroll for someone? Um, not if that's personally not if that's your role. If you were hired to create content as the brand of a company, you are a ghostwriter. Or if you were hired to create persuasive content for a company, you are the copywriter. Yeah, yeah, I think it goes either way. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because you know, because I I think of a ghostwriter as you know, you write something and then a a, a a a second person says it's under my umbrella, it's under my signature. When you write something for a company, it's under the company's signature or their mm -hmm. their their letterhead. Well, yeah, right. Like, but um, if you think about, you know, like Ink Magazine or Ink dot com, you know, they have they have staff writers, but they still get their, you know, that's still their author byline at the end of the post or the article or whatever you want to call it. And then, um, of course, you have businesses or agencies that that have just staff writers, and and they're all all ghost writers. But yeah, I think when you are on a staff, you're probably one or the other. There's probably not too many hats being worn. Uh, when you're there. And I was thinking about your question a little bit more, Jessica. I, I don't think I, I quite understood it the first time around. And, and um, You know, I'm trying to think about it now. How could you get the, 
social media agency to really uh, get your voice out there and your brand. And um, you know that's that's a pretty tough one. But again, I think I think that's all about spending time with each other. Um, and and you know probably you doing you know some of the tweeting and letting them see uh, you know your tweets and how you're doing it and um, I mean this probably isn't a great answer but <laughs> uh, I think it just all boils down to time like we said before you know kind of opening yourself up and letting letting them see who you are and, and how you are and you know all that great stuff. No, that, that that that's a great answer, Chris. That that that's a that's a thousand dollar answer because what a, I, because well, I was, I'm segueing into the plus two takeaway because it's natural. So finish your thought and then we'll go. Sure. There. Okay. And it's because what I think you're saying, Chris, is just because you hire a ghostwriter doesn't mean that you abrogate your responsibility to be involved with the process. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Like like Nora said, it still takes time. And well, you have to be involved. Just can I just two cents it real quick? Or you know me, 37 cents? Nope. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> oh, wait, that's Phil. <laughs> By the way, hi, Phil. <laughs> hi, Phil. So, so yeah, for a really, really long time, and I think until today's show, like I didn't appreciate the value. I'm not saying I didn't appreciate what ghostwriters did and the content they created, because I totally do. But I always kind of looked at it like a little less than being integrity and that... Um, yeah, you know, it just wasn't right. It didn't feel sincere or genuine to me. But having this conversation, looking back, like, so you're in high school, you're in grade school, your parents check your paper, you have a tutor, you have teachers that, you know, make your final essay better than it should be or would have been if you did it all on your own. And kind of there's no difference. If you have people on your team, whether you're paying for them or not to make your work better, does it really matter just as long as you're giving the greatest thing possible to your audience, tribe, community, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to the hairstylist for a haircut tomorrow. Oh, heck yeah. yeah so, <laughs> not that you <laughs> not. <laughs> I love that. I'm glad we came back to that a little bit because I think that that, um, I think that that, you know, it, it lends a lot of depth and this this has been really good for me because I didn't know what was going to come out of this conversation so far and we are not done we're just taking a short break for our plus two takeaway so it, momentarily okay Scott what's the scoop here okay so as as uh, you know Jess and as many but maybe not all of the members of our uh, audience know we, we have a plus two takeaway and all of this month we have been um, uh, reviewing the book um, in terms of the plus two takeaway called the one thing so there that is and it is got the subtitle of the surprising simple truth behind extraordinary results and it's by Gary Keller who also happens to be uh, somewhat on Google Plus and bully for him I think that's terrific and at the beginning of the book he has this thing that says it's a Russian proverb it's that if you chase two rabbits you won't catch either one and I just think that's terrific so uh, there are uh, four sections and this is the fourth of the four that we have put together and it's the extraordinary results and it's at this point Jess that I uh, hand it over to you so it's your turn okay so this one this part of the the section of the book really talks about a self of a self mission if you will so it walks you through how to create your purpose and think about your purpose so that you can understand what that overarching one thing might be and then how do you ask the question uh, how do you ask that qualifying question to determine which are the actions to take alright Scott next slide and I love I love this this whole P thing there's purpose productivity excuse me purpose priority and productivity and really your purpose is your compass so once you understand what your purpose is you now have a direction to go and what that compass does is it guides you in the general direction so you can set your priorities for each of the areas that you are going to choose to pay attention to in your life at any one time well one at a time but there may be many priorities that you are switching your priority your focus between which drives the actions that we choose to get the best the best 
results that will actually amplify and make easier the next the next set of actions we're going to take. So the whole idea of the one thing is what is the right action to take so that future actions are easier or unnecessary. So you're like clearing the way a little bit to get to this, to get to your priorities and stay in line with the direction of your compass. And I did just learn that uh, 37 cents came from you first, Norris, so I'm giving it back to you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and so the next part is to go ahead, Scott. The next part is to live by priority. We have to train our mind how to think. So once we know what our purpose is, how are we thinking about things, and how are we really working on living in our priorities and honoring them and only them, and we've heard it everywhere else and he says it Gary says it in this in the one thing as well once you've thought about it you better write it down because once it's written it's more real and you have concrete actions to take and measure against and so that's something that I always like to hear that one come up over and over again and in the end there is only one one thing there is only one direction on that compass of your life that you are going to follow uh, and make the progress that you want to make. So if everything in the different parts of your life and the, the priorities that you have chosen all align with that one compass, so we'll use me as an example. I, um, My purpose is to help other people tell their stories effectively in whatever form that takes, connecting businesses to customers and the people within those businesses to those customers to build relationships. So that actually happens in my personal life too, which I thought was really interesting when I was really thinking about this. So, um, Nora, you can blue box me to watch. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I get oh, so memorized. I, Go ahead. Stay put. Don't don't change yet. I'm not there yet. So stay right there. Um, but she's watching. She's watching the film. She's watching in the film strip. She's not watching what I blue boxed. That's the. When you're on the panel, it's a different experience than if you're watching in the audience <laughs> at this moment in time. Uh, so we live for productivity, and we need a time management system. So whatever your, you can zoom into this one now, Scott. Whatever your time management system is, honor it, love it, live it. Uh, Gary is fond of time blocking and saying, you know what, whatever your one thing is for this day, so in your business, what is your one thing? And you're going to choose that one action within that one thing to drive forward momentum, and you're going to do that first. He's a believer of doing your one thing first as well. So I'm a little bit more lenient. We all have our own rhythms, so we just have to find that time where the most creative and we have the ability to focus and whatever that is and however you block that time, whether you have to put up a sign, whether you have to put um, crime scene evidence tape around your office so nobody comes in, whatever you have to do is what you need to do because it really is you and the actions that you take and the, the thought that you are putting into this. So to do, to protect that and keep working on your one thing, that would be vacation, personal days, mental health days, whatever you call them, take them. And uh, that also means that you do need time to review your planning. The, what you've done in the past and where you're going to make any adjustments that you need on any regular basis. And that takes us to the next piece, which is no matter what, we need to keep our eyes on our one thing because of how easy it is to be distracted, whether you have shiny object syndrome or some other distraction piece, that something that distracts you easily, creative avoidance. I mean, when I'm really avoiding things, I clean. So you all know what it is. <laughs> you all know what yours is. Just identify it and know it so you can honor that. And don't double book yourself. One of the things like, oh, maybe I can listen to a podcast while I do my one thing. Or maybe I can listen to the replay of a hangout while I do my one thing. Or maybe I can do my one thing while I'm watching a movie I wanted to catch up on. Bad idea because you really can't focus, you really can't take the time and energy it needs. Now there's a thing called um, being an, uh, moving from entrepreneur 
to productivity. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting, I've got to find this, going from E to P, because when we're an entrepreneur stage, this is like, I'm going to go to a, a lemonade stand, the lemonade stand that you might have. You're going to sell all the lemonade you can, and you're going to earn that money. I mean, when my dad was a kid, he took his lawnmower, and he would walk for five miles to mow people's lawns just so he could earn money. Realistically, um, he probably, you know, when you so you get in that mood of being mode of being an entrepreneur entrepreneur and taking that action and the example that he gives in the book is an entrepreneur will say okay I'm gonna be in the yard for a while to cut down a tree because you asked me to cut down a tree the person that's in productive mode is gonna go alright let me think about this for a second oh chainsaw ta-da and off they go to cut down their tree so that's that breakthrough point is how do you how, how do you actually stop being just acting all the time because you can and move into a place where you can step back and think so you can actually understand and embrace what an opportunity is to leap over where you're at to get you to that next stage and have the momentum to keep knocking down those dominoes that are twice as tall so you have a domino this tall and you have a domino twice as tall then you have a domino three times as tall and it's exponentially growing and your action will take you where you want it to go all right Scott and so there are four thieves of pro productivity that Gary talks about that I think are worth spending a little, bit, a little bit of time. The first is being able to say no. The second is knowing that um, chaos exists and being afraid of it. The third one is poor health habits. And the fourth one is um, poor space design. So how are you using yourself in space? Are you eating well? And it is not spiked, I promise. My green, my green drink <laughs> is not spiked. And um, knowing that chaos and life happens and really being sacred with your time because every single time you say yes means you're saying no to something else and is what you're saying yes to supporting your overall one thing and is what you're saying so then in turn what you're saying no to is it out of line with your one thing and if they don't if they're not doing what you want them to do or you're saying yes to things that don't help you knock down your dominoes then you need to it's a good time during that planning period to revisit that alright Scott so what's our journey we go back to the question and this one zooms in right yep. what's the one thing I can do such that by doing everything else will be easier or unnecessary it all starts with each one of us the heart and the mind and the space that we create and how we show up. And that wraps up everything that we've talked about with the one thing so far in the book. Now I will tell you on April 8th we are going to have a panel discussion about the one thing. So if you have read the book, are reading the book, or and because of those two criteria are interested in joining us on our panel discussion, just drop us a note in the comments of the event send a note to me or to Scott and we will make sure that you are invited and it's will fill up the panel and we'll take up to uh, seven people because that's what we have room for so thank you very much for sharing a few minutes with us to talk about the one thing tonight and that brings us back to some closing comments that we might have so how do you guys see Nora and Chris some of the things that we talked about can you tie anything that we talked about today back to what was just shared about section three, uh, or excuse me, section four of the one thing. All right, okay, uh, we'll go with ladies first. So, I mean, I think clearly this already touches upon what Chris said. So productivity, time management, how you're prioritizing things. If writing is not your strength, clearly one option that you could choose would be ghostwriting. And that, that still gives you the option of speaking freely, still being in your values, still providing what you would want to provide, making your impact in the world, and not having to really write yourself, which is fabulous. Yeah. Leave it to the pros like Chris. That's right. Or Lori. Or Kit. Uh, or Chris. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm actually pretty speechless. That's <laughs> pretty good stuff. I'm going to have to pick that up and, and read it. Uh, I mean, there's a, so much of it there. Uh, I mean, the 
the health thing, the space thing, all of that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm actually pretty speechless. I, I'm, I'm guilty of every one of those things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a recover, I also, I, I'm a recovering I also, yes person. I, I also know, Chris, that you uh, value family time and uh, that you have arranged your uh, life uh, uh, in, in a way in which uh, that plays a part as well in terms of your one thing. So uh, I, 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 I can see and I was thinking that there may be you know, several things that are in harmony with uh, what you're already doing successfully that uh, Jess was talking about tonight. Yeah, uh, definitely. Family is a big thing to me. Uh, my son is, you know, that you know, my only. That's my whole world. So uh, everything goes back to him. Um, everything I do and stuff like that. So yeah, saying yes to all that other stuff and trying to be healthy and and uh, you know think about productivity and uh, all that stuff. It all goes back to that for me, for sure. Awesome. And so here, Phil says, it's a great book. I highly recommend it. Psst, he's going to be on our panel, so mark your calendar, Phil. And then, um, <laughs> if you didn't the rule know, breaker? You know, yeah, that's right. Hey. <laughs> the rule breaker. <laughs> and then um, Kitty says, intentionally, intentionality leads to productivity. A quote from Denise Hughes. And <laughs> I have social media syndrome, purposeful action. I love that. that. That's my hashtag. So excited. And yes, you totally need this book. I would agree with that. Yeah. Scott? So yeah. it's, one, it, it's, it's one of those books that I, I wish that I had had it when I was uh, my son's age, and I wish I would have had the wisdom to have uh, uh, actually taken its story to heart. It is... Uh, you you really came up with a winner when you suggested this book, um, and I I still hope that uh, Gary Keller will you know at some point think, man, we I'd sure like to be on the Just Plus Scott Plus You show because, you know, that's my one thing for today. We need a campaign going. Let's do it. Well, there all we right. go. He, he he. All right. He he is on. He you know he does have a page on uh, G plus and uh, he he has presence here. So, uh, we're going to uh, officially launch the uh, campaign based on your great suggestion, Nora, and we'll uh, we'll uh, keep you in the loop in terms of um, what good. happens with that. Heck yeah! I think that's heck yeah. Up. Heck yeah! So I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. I learned a lot. I know that it was a really fun discussion and opened up my eyes to new things. Thank you, Nora. Thank you, Chris. I am so excited you were able to join us. This really made our show amazing tonight. And we're going to close with this comment, and then we'll go, we'll go to the animated close, Scott. And Phil says, this is all really interesting. It's making me look at ghostwriting differently. I'm not ready to say I'm sold on the idea, but I love the discussion and learning some things I didn't know about. Me too. Me too. Me too. Thank you, Scott and Justin, everyone. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, and, uh, and all I have to say is tonight has uh, lived up to its billing, which is uh, summed up in one word, and I would say that is it's been magical. Thank you. Thank you.